You're listening to the Common Sense Money Bomb Marathon, put on the 10th by the 10th Amendment Center. I'm Emmy O'Neill, and I'm your host. To donate to the 10th Amendment Center, please visit www.commonsensemoneybomb.com and click on Donate. My birthday is coming up this month, and my only wish is to advance liberty, so please get online and donate to the Common Sense Money Bomb. Our next guest is Tom Woods. Tom Woods is a noted economist, historian, and he's also a New York Times bestselling author. He authored Meltdown and Nullification, How to Resist Federal Tyranny in the 21st Century. Welcome to the show, Tom. How are you? I'm doing great, Emily. Thanks for having me. Well, we're honored to have you on the show, Tom. You're an excellent person to discuss this issue with. I appreciate that. Thanks. So, my first question is, what events inspired you to write Nullification? Uh, Well... You know, it's funny, I, I've been writing about and speaking about this subject from the point of view of an American historian. I mean, it's an interesting historical topic, but I always sort of it would remain a historical topic. I, I didn't think anyone would really think to themselves that we might actually, you know, put out the effort to make this a reality in our own day. And then, all of a sudden, I noticed uh, that there were people linking on blogs and websites to some of my videos on this subject, and... I saw that some of the Tea Party groups were interested in it, and it occurred to me, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe things really are changing. Maybe the terms of the debate are changing enough that we could actually get a hearing for this, and we might actually be able to make this happen. So I decided, well, if that's the case, then I want to get out there and write sort of the handbook for this, the, the, the book that gives you all the arguments you need to explain why this is justified morally, constitutionally, historically, and so on. So that when people do go out there and try to defend these ideas, they'll have all the ammunition they need when, you know, they get attacked by, you know, pretty much from all sides. They'll be able to defend themselves and so. Right. So you, you really see this as a, as a handbook, Tom. So what, what do you encourage people to do to fight against this? I know that you, you call this, you know, it's your, your duty to resist uh, these unconstitutional laws. So what do you re- recommend that people do? Well, one thing that's been really gratifying so far is that even relatively early on in this particular movement, we started to hear the word nullification being used more and more. I mean, it's coming up in discussion. And now sometimes it's coming up in order to to denounce it, but it's being talked about for the first time in a very long time, and that's an encouraging thing. So just you know, push the envelope by talking about forbidden ideas like nullification. That's a very important first step. And in fact, we have two people who are likely, in my opinion, likely presidential candidates for 2012, uh, Ron Paul, but also uh, Governor Gary Johnson, who have both, both spoken in favor of, of nullification. I mean, this, I, this just hasn't been heard in the longest time. In fact, my own sort of playful recommendation is that we ought to go out of our way to insert the word nullify into our casual conversation. So you know, we <laughs> drink from the bar like a bourbon on the rocks, and we say, oh, I thought I'd, I'd like to nullify that order. I prefer it. Yeah. You know, just, just, get it, just continue. In fact, in fact we, this is no joke. we actually had a plumber come over to our house, and he stood there explaining to us that his work is guaranteed for X number of days, but the following conditions would nullify this. And I, and I, looked at, I thought to myself, is, is he speaking in code? Is, is he trying to let me know? <laughs> but I, I, probably he was just... He wants, a, he wants a book signed, Tom. Maybe that's what he was getting at. <laughs> but all the same. So, so, uh, but but uh, really what I want to point out here is, is the, the importance of the Tenth Amendment Center, because that's what I... I mean, I, I genuinely... I'm not just saying this because I'm on this money bomb marathon, but really when people ask me, well, gee, what should I do then? I mean, okay, so I've read about this. I agree with it. I, I think it makes perfect sense. But now what's the next step? I always refer them right to the Tenth Amendment Center because that, that Tenth Amendment Center website will give you, you know, will show you what's going on in your state, what initiatives are out there, what you can get behind, um, you know, like-minded people you can get to know, initiatives you can back, all these sorts of things you can find, you know, with, the, with a single mouse click at TenthAmendmentCenter.com. So it is an it is an essential, it's just an outstanding site and a great organization. In fact, Michael Bolden, who started it, one of the twenty thousand things I, I love about Michael Bolden is that he's so charismatic that even when somebody wants to write a smear piece on him, when they actually meet him, they just they can't bring themselves mm-hmm. to do it. 
So, for example, Mother Jones, sort of left-wing magazine, um, did an interview with him. They clearly were intending to smear and trash him and all the rest of the, the usual treatment. But they got to know him, and they were talking to him and interviewing him, and he was so not what they were expecting. He was not the... Uh, you know the stuff shirt type, and the, he wasn't the. He, he was exactly the opposite of what they were expecting to meet. So by the end of it, quite in spite of herself, the author couldn't help it. She had to write a favorable piece. Now that is a great. That's a great uh, development because that shows we've got an organization whose head can uh, can be really a sympathetic character in the media when we're dealing with a topic like nullification that is viewed very unsympathetically by the media, that's, that's a, a critical ingredient, I think, in, in our success. Absolutely. Tom, and, and just to, to bring that up, how did this get such, such a, a bad rap? I, I remember during the time of the elections, I was reading a liberal blog that listed the top 10 most dangerous ideas espoused by Republican candidates, and nullification was on that list as one of those dangerous ideas. And I thought, how could how could someone disagree with this? So, why are the liberals so afraid of nullification? And what what I mean by liberals, just people who are sympathetic to the state or even some conservatives, why are they so afraid of it? Right. Well, the the official reason they'll give, which I, I don't believe is the real reason, is that uh, you know these ideas have been used, for example, during the civil rights movement. They were used for purposes that most people today would find grotesque uh, to, to fight against some of the advances of the civil rights movement. And so naturally it is being said that, well, therefore, obviously the only people who could possibly support these ideas are sinister people, blah, 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 blah. What they don't point out is, well, okay, well, that's maybe not a fair example because at the time uh, you'll notice that because of various restrictions in the southern states, blacks by and large were deprived of voting rights. So it was a lot easier at that time to take advantage of them. Well, we're not living in that America anymore. Everybody has the right to vote now. Uh, politicians can't do that to people anymore. So this is apples and oranges to be pulling that out. Our point is that there's nothing, it's just, it's a neutral principle to say that our decisions ought to be made at the local level wherever possible, uh, if not always. That's a neutral principle. That, that doesn't support left or right. That's just a neutral procedural norm that we are proposing, and that over the course of American history, overwhelmingly, this principle has been used on behalf of human freedom. And that's one of the points I make in the book, Nullification, is to actually dig up this totally forgotten history, history that you won't get from these uh, the very people you're talking about. And so I point out what the New England states used nullification for. They were using it to fight against an embargo, to fight against unconstitutional searches and seizures, against military conscription, that they were using it to fight against the fugitive slave laws, which they believed aspects of them were unconstitutional. I mean, you can look at again and again and again, these principles were used for totally honorable purposes. And I'm always in this context, um, I'm always inclined to remind people that if you look at the great tyrants of the 20th century, how many of them believed in the idea of state nullification? I mean, is it zero? I, I would, I'd say zero. <laughs> so, so why would that be? Like, why? Now, that's, I'm not saying, therefore, that every opponent of nullification is Hitler. You know, I mean, I don't resort to those sorts of tactics that the left does. But nevertheless, it should at least give you pause. Well, gee, why is it that I'm supporting an idea... Um, you know, the opposition to nullification that would also have been favored by Stalin and Hitler. And, like every, and, of course, the answer is that every tyrant who ever lived wants to exercise absolute power over all the territory within his, uh, his realm. And so the idea of nullification, in effect, says that, no, in this particular state and over these particular sorts of areas, you have no authority over us. And that's precisely why, in Mein Kampf, Hitler was so eager to point out that if he came to power, he would abolish states' rights altogether because they are an obstacle to the exercise of absolute power. Well, that's why we like them. That's why we like the idea of states' rights. And that's why the real progressives, not the phony baloney, Matt Iglesias, uh, think progress, uh, you know, uh, regime type of progressives, but real progressives who actually believe in small is beautiful and local control 
and local this and that, real progressives actually are sympathetic to this idea. Real progressives realize that nationalism has not, throughout most of history, been a progressive force. That the progressive force is leave people alone, let people run their lives in their own neighborhoods. That, that is, that's a Jeffersonian principle that you can find uh, genuine people on the left and genuine people on the right agreeing on. I agree completely. I think that that my perception of some liberals has been that they should agree with decentralization of power. I thought that's what it was about. And it it really shocks me that, that a, a lot of liberals can get on board with, with these pro-state type conservatives on a lot of issues. And then that's how you realize that the two groups, they're not so different. Um, I was going to bring this up. I was actually, I was watching the news the other day and they had this whole um, investigative report about how history books in classrooms were getting dates wrong, f- dates wrong for Civil War battles and just basic facts. They were getting completely wrong. So how did this all start? Do you think that, you know, education is a, is a huge issue and that people are just not informed from the start? How do we unteach these ideas or how do we kind of unravel the kind of propaganda that has been uh, instilled in, in the public education system to students? How do we go about changing people's minds about it? Well, one of the things that I did, I mean, I was a professor for some years, and then since then I've, I, I actually kind of enjoy my life now where um, I, I left that position voluntarily. I actually like just working for myself. But one of the things I've done all along is, first of all, aimed my message primarily at younger people. Now, that's not to say that, you know, anybody over 30 is the enemy. Um, <laughs> I call it that camp myself, but that it's, it's the younger people whose ideas are still being formed, you know, who, who haven't committed to a philosophy so that no matter what you say, they're never going to change their minds. Whereas I think probably I'm at that point now. I mean, I, I, I'm so convinced of this that probably nothing anyone says could change my mind. But if I were 18 or 19 and I'm still thinking things over, then my, my mind is open enough that I might be able to be persuaded. So I, I want to hit that sort of age group, 18 to 25, the, the, the group that uh, had never heard the sorts of things that somebody like Ron Paul was saying about uh, free market and freedom and all, this, all the rest of it. They never heard any of this stuff. All they had heard is canned speeches from plastic men, and, and they responded. Well, that's the sort of demographic that... I, I want to hit because I think that's the one where we're most likely to get people who aren't so committed to the standard view of everything, to the Newsweek view of life, the U.S. News and World Report, New York Times view of life. They're actually willing to consider options that aren't presented to them by Newt Gingrich or Hillary Clinton. They're actually willing to consider there might be a third option, heaven forbid, in, in the way they should think about politics and, and, and life. So I, so I want to hit them, and when I do that, what I also typically do is appeal to their sort of natural teenage rebelliousness in, in, in that I say to them, now look, here are the sorts of things that they want you to believe, that they try to ram down your throats in your history classes and in your books and on TV and in the newspapers and all the all fashionable opinion is trying to tell you not to consider these ideas, don't listen to us and so on. But, you know, do you really want them to do your thinking for you? Who are these creeps? You know, I mean, why, why, you know, don't, don't you, uh, don't you have some kind of sense that something should be quite right here in the country? And maybe it's these people themselves who aren't right, right? Why are you going to let them do your thing? That sort of thing. Yeah, they say, yeah. You know, who, who's been keeping these ideas from me? I mean, what, what's going on here, man? I'm going to think for myself. You know, that works. It works. People respond to that. That's actually what happened to me. I'm 22 now. But when I first got to college, um, it seemed that that I was getting into a lot of arguments with my peers because they just wanted to believe things that they they were being told. And I thought, you know, that's not that's not being a critical thinker. They were just kind of regurgitating what different professors were saying. And so I I agree that that age in particular to really get the students that are impressionable and just say, hey, you can think for yourself and you know, here here are the options, and why why would you trust that someone is is telling you the truth if they believe in this this or that that's you know unconstitutional unconstitutional or immoral? Why would you blindly agree with them? 
So yeah, that's that, that's ex- exactly. In fact, that's what sort of thing that got me thinking. That 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 broke me out of the very very sort of mainstream mold that I was in back in the early '90s when I was a young college student. You know, I mean, you could have scripted and predicted everything that came out of my stupid mouth. I mean, it was just every <laughs> every GOP platitude bumper sticker slogan. I mean, that was level of my thinking. And then suddenly, thankfully, I was exposed to people who thought, well, you know, maybe life can't actually fit on a bumper sticker. You know, maybe there is, maybe there is something other than, <clears throat> you know, Rush Limbaugh or Keith Olbermann. And again, there, maybe there is an alternative. Maybe these two are actually a lot closer than we realize. Maybe there's a third alternative. And so that's basically where I've been ever since. And uh, again, I can't help, and, and Michael or none of these people have asked me to do or say any of this stuff, but I just can't emphasize enough what uh, a help in all this for me the Tenth Amendment Center has been. To be able to have that thing there, refer people to it, and they have contributed to putting on this wonderful tour around the country where we've got uh, hundreds of people at every one of these events getting very excited about these ideas and forcing them into the political conversation. That, that's been what's been so great about it. They have forced these ideas into the political conversation. I mean, before, you couldn't talk about it. No one, was, no one would bring it up, so it, it never came before the general public for their consideration. But now, uh, the Tenth Amendment Center and WeRefuse.com, they are taking these ideas they're going from city to city and forcing their way in. They say, okay, you're not going to talk about it? Then we're going to stand here with a giant bullhorn, and you're going to hear us. And not only are you going to hear us, but we're going to have a great time. We are going to refuse to uh, live up to the characters that you expect to see. We're not going to be, uh, you know, the, the wicked, you know, p- people who are pining for slavery, whatever the ridiculous... Uh, caricatures are, but we're actually regular people, you know, young regular people having a great time, who believe in, in in freedom and believe that you know maybe people uh, ought to make their decisions among themselves. That instead of referring everything to Washington D.C., instead of doing that dehumanizing thing all the time, why don't we have a more humane existence where, on the local level, we can begin to make more decisions. Like, why is that bad? Why is that so bad that it's never even proposed by anybody in any of the, in either of the two major political parties? This is what the Tenth Amendment Center has made possible. It, 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 is, it is on the front lines of changing the way uh, we talk about politics, the way people think about how to solve problems, at what level they should be solved. It, it, it's, it, and it was, it's just done by one guy. I mean, now we've got state chapter coordinators, and that's wonderful, but it was Michael Bolden who started this thing, just one guy, and this one guy has made such an impact. So I, I hope people will uh, will go over there. Is it? I think it's commonsensemoneybomb.com, and if they can support this organization. Now, I'm not a member of the Tenth Amendment, so I don't, in fact, I don't know if you can be a member, so I, I have no immediate direct affiliation with it. I'm just saying that it is one of a handful of organizations that I, I believe are 100% trustworthy and deserving of, of our support, our moral support and our financial support, uh, even during these difficult times. And Tom, along with Michael, uh, with starting the Tenth Amendment Center, you know, he's that inspiration for, for getting active. You have also inspired so many people to get active in the cause and to just, you know, even if you have to stand there alone with the bullhorn and talk about your views and educate people. That's what it's about. And uh, I have fun at these rallies, going to these these um, different events because I feel truly American. To me, that's that's what being a patriot is all about. I'm actually, um, I'm a daughter of the American Revolution. My ancestors fought in the Revolutionary War. So I kind of feel like it's in my blood that I have to get out there and, and be active and stand up for this cause. So absolutely, what it's great. What part of the country are you in? I'm actually from New Hampshire. So do you still live there? No, I, I moved down to the Washington, D.C. area to uh, pretty much start the fight because New Hampshire, I thought, was... They're doing all right right now. But uh, D.C., D.C. is what I'm concerned about. Okay, yeah, I was just thinking because, of course, there's a great uh, event scheduled for March, of course. Uh, for Nullify, Nullify now. now. event in New Hampshire, March 19th. And I, I point that out because I'm I'm from Massachusetts, and I 
always look forward to the chance to get to New England for a speaking engagement, but yet invitations are few and far between for New England. I get them all other sections of the country, but New England, uh, you know, I get uh, a little discouraged about, well, is there enough support for this? So that when I heard that we were going to have a big event in New Hampshire, I, I couldn't have been happier. This, this will be great. New Hampshire would be the part of New England where we most likely get um, a really strong response. And the motto, live free or die, that still remains true for the people who are truly patriots and believe in the Constitution. I know that there's a, there's a growing movement in New Hampshire now for liberty-minded individuals to come together. Fortunately, no offense to Massachusetts, uh, where you're from, Tom, but there is kind of a problem with some of the people in Massachusetts moving up to New Hampshire because they complain oh, yeah. about taxes and they complain about uh, how bad the government is in Massachusetts, and then they move to New Hampshire and vote for you no know, oh, more yeah. entitlements. Oh, yeah, they have no idea what's, you know, how they screwed up Massachusetts. They just know it doesn't work. Then they go to New Hampshire and try to do exactly the same thing. So it, I wish there was some way we could peacefully persuade them not to move to New Hampshire. <laughs> you, know, just, then, uh, you know, things aren't so good up here after all. You might as well just stick it out in mass. I, I wish there was some way. Because what a shame, because there is such good work being done in New Hampshire. Right. I mean, maybe there should be a, a campaign started called Go Back to Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> New Hampshire wants to, wants to be the live for your die state. So you can, you can keep your taxes as entitlements, but stay in Massachusetts. Yeah, exactly. So, Tom, real quick. Place, but uh, very hard to live there, unfortunately, in Massachusetts. But, right. uh, but anyways, this is, this is just one example, though, of the ambitious plans that uh, the, the center and its friends have for 2011. I mean, it looks like they're going to do even more events in 2011 than they did in 2010. It's just going to be in more and more places. And they're bringing in what's great about this also is that you know, the, a lot of the major talk show people won't touch this with a 10-foot pole because, in my opinion, they're cowards. Um, but what the Tenth Amendment Center has done is gone totally over their heads. And so they've gone right to the 912 groups, right to the Tea Party groups, and said, look, I know that the dick armies of the world are never going to endorse this idea, but you guys probably like it, don't you? You guys probably understand that just sitting around waiting for these problems to be solved or trying the same old methods isn't going to work. Yeah, you know that. So come on out to our event. And so we've gotten a huge response from these sorts of groups that otherwise would never have heard of these ideas because they're, certainly their organizations aren't going to push anything like this. Why, that's out of the mainstream. Oh, my heavens, who would ever want to be out of the mainstream? Who would ever want to be out of the continuum that runs from Newsweek to U.S. News and World Report to uh, Mitt Romney, to Hillary Clinton. I mean, who would ever want to be anywhere but in that continuum, right? But that's the way a lot of a lot of these organizations think, and they're trying to keep these grassroots people in line and keep them respectable. But there are enough of them who say, well, you know what? I'm, I'm sick of being so-called respectable. I don't want to be respected by Hillary Clinton. Uh, then I, I'm obviously doing something wrong. No, I want to. I want. I'm curious. I want to know what can we really do that might have some practical, some good practical effect. And that's where the Tenth Amendment Center and the Nullify Now Tour and all its good work uh, come in. So I, I hope people will, will go out and support the Tenth Amendment Center. They really need, they are not blowing the money. <laughs> Michael Bolden lives an extremely frugal existence. I have talked to him over Skype. I know I know where he lives. Uh, he, you know, you, this is I, I'm, I'm telling you this. It is plowed into this organization, and every penny is monitored carefully, which is a very rare thing to say, because typically, if you look at these big D.C. foundations, uh, one doesn't usually say quite the same thing. The president drives around in a limousine. Uh, Michael has no limousine. I can say that for sure. I don't even know if he has a car. And that's, that's exactly why the Tenth Amendment Center, this is a grassroots organization. You know, we don't have these these people that are funding this organization that you know have special interests these are people who are truly concerned about the state of our nation or and are concerned about um, the federal government just growing too powerful and I think it's absolutely admirable that there are people like yourself that are you know standing up and not not being uh, cowardly like a lot of a lot of people are in, in the mainstream media and you're actually you're speaking the truth. 
And I think that's admirable. And I thank you for inspiring so many people to get involved and, and to get active and really fight for what's right. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. And I hope, um, oh, who, who's the guest coming on after me? Is that the last guest, after the one after me? No, actually, we have we have two more guests. Um, Mike Mahari is going to be next. Okay, okay. So, uh, so I guess we'll, we, we may as well wrap things up. But uh, yep. in case I haven't been perfectly clear, I'll just say support the Tenth of Heaven Center. It needs your support. It's a great organization. Uh, when I first heard the name Tenth Amendment Center, I I actually I admit I thought to myself, oh, here we go, it's one of these middle of the road. Oh, if only we could get back to the Tenth Amendment. No, 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 no. The beautiful thing about the Tenth Amendment Center is its view that you, know, you can't just beg for your Tenth Amendment rights. You exercise them. I mean, that's, that was certainly how Jefferson felt. You, you don't wait for the federal government to say to you, you know what, we really shouldn't be intervening in this part of your lives because the Constitution doesn't authorize it. No, you just simply peacefully say, uh, you know, in a, in a sort of mass civil disobedience like has gone on in California with the medical marijuana, you say, well, look, this, <laughs> you're wrong. You have no right to do this. You know it. The whole country knows it. So we're just going to go on as before. And sometimes, as with the fugitive slave laws, it does indeed work. So I hope people will support this great organization. And I mean, there, I have, I, I can't think of how many times I've gone on things like this. It's just a handful of times, really, that I've gone on to support an organization. I mean, probably the Mises Institute and maybe one or two other organizations I, I can think of that I would actually urge people to donate money to, because I, I always feel funny asking people for money. Um, but here, I promise you, it will be well spent, <clears throat> and you can be proud to support an organization that is genuinely on the cutting edge these days. Yeah, well, thank you so much, for Tom, Tom, for coming on the show and all that you do. Um, so thank you again. We're actually going to move on to our next guest, but it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Uh, the pleasure was mine. Best of luck with this. Thank you, Tom.